what would you recommend for people to begin reading? So you mentioned Jacques Loeb, for example. Uh, are there any other people that talk about this, like books, like from the reading list that you would recommend for the public? Uh, Mind in the Making by James Harvey Robinson, or The Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase, or Science and Sanity by Alfred Korzybski. Okay. There are many books on Skinner. sociology, anthropology, B.F. Skinner, on behavior. Um, but, of course, what I want to talk about is a is how we get to be the way we are. Sure. Actually, if you don't understand the effects of environment on behavior, if you take a, a nice Jewish boy and bring him up in Nazi Germany as a baby, and all he hears is Heil Hitler, Deutschland over alles, he's going to become a Nazi. And if you take a Nazi baby and bring him up by an Israeli family, meaning an Israeli environment, he's going to, going to become a nice Jewish boy. And if you take a nice Jewish boy and bring him up in Ireland, he's going to speak with an Irish bog. And there's not a thing he can do about it. Now, if you're brought up in France, say, ten years, then you move to Germany and you live there ten years, you will speak with a German-French accent. And if you're brought up in the Deep South, you'll speak as a Southerner would. And if you're brought up in an uneducated region of the South, you'd speak against the blacks, against the Jews, against foreigners, if that's the environment you're exposed to. It's not so much. You know, a lot of the genes think, uh, of the geneticists think, that there are genes that, that uh, are democratic genes that give you a propensity toward becoming a Democrat. Some believe that there's such a thing as a criminal gene. It seems so obvious that the environment generates aberrant behavior. You know, what you call today decent and ethical people might be considered criminal in the future. For example, a lawyer that can take language and manipulate it in such a way as to win a case is really a criminal. A judge who who assigns people to prison sentences for 10 or 20 years without knowing anything about their background would be considered a criminal in the future. You know, in the old days, a definition of a criminal is one who removed an object without your permission. Today, the definition has changed. New definition of a criminal, one who's caught. Right. So the people in Washington today, most of the government officials would be considered criminals in the future. Just as you consider human sacrifice criminal. You know, in the old days, Romans used to go to watch Christians being fed to lions. Of course, in those days, that was an event. The whole family would go. And the kids would say, Daddy, can I come next week to see Christians being fed to lions? He might say, Son, only if you behave yourself. So you see, what passed in the, and, and what, what went by in, in the distant past was considered normal for that culture. Now, bullfights are normal in Spain. And setting a bull loose in the street, chasing after people, might consider it normal in the future be considered criminal. So you see, all your definitions are insufficient. When a person says, I believe in a certain thing, is it that they believe in it, or have they been programmed to believe in it? You see, every culture you're brought up in emphasizes what they consider the good points of their culture. If you're brought up in the Arab nation, it's normal to have ten wives if you can afford it. But many people today look down upon a person having more than one wife in America or England. But remember, there was a time when King Solomon had a thousand wives, and I never saw anybody get angry at that. Of course, that was considered normal in the old days, to have as many wives as you can afford. Today, it's considered criminal. So our definitions are very old, our language is very old, it was designed hundreds of years ago. And instead of people talking to each other, they talk at each other. So I'm going to say this clearly if I can, that the world you live in is essentially 
insufficient to produce behavior that's sane. Aberrant behavior is not an inborn thing unless there's a degenerative disease of the brain. And if that occurs, we certainly don't put people in jail. And if they've been conditioned to be thieves, liars, or serial killers, it's our job to undo those things. So, in other words, if you have an automobile and it veers to the right, you can kick the fenders or you can check your tire pressure. If the tire pressure is uneven, it'll veer to the right or left. And the same with the steering column. You have to check the physical apparatus just as an electrical engineer does. When he checks your computer out, he checks area by area. Oops, you human right. behavior. In human behavior, you have people put, put in jail for aberrant behavior. But we never touch the environment that generates that behavior. Even psychologists and psychiatrists work on individuals. It's really not the individual. It's the environment that they're reared in that creates social insufficiency and behavioral insufficiency. They're working ass backwards when you work on a person. It would take you years. If you work on a person and they return to the same aberrated environment, it's not going to help very much. So child molesters are not born. They're made that way through certain scales of behavior which we don't pay attention to. And psychologists that try to adjust you to this system have to be somewhat of a prune head that is insufficiently educated. Right. I just want to mention that um, a lot of parents in some way really understand this, maybe won't admit it, but... Even they, when they see their kids hanging around with other kids that they think are detrimental, they'll pull them away or they won't allow them to hang around with them. So if they didn't feel it was inborn that they would come out a certain way, then they wouldn't do that. Right. I, I, I think um, it's amazing how most people seem to understand the, causal, the causality of the environment and what it creates, uh, but they just simply seem to reject it like, for example, we still have a lot of people that believe that if you, were, if you gave, say, our interdisciplinary teams positions of so-called authority, which, you know, again, those who really understand this direction know that we're using computers as tools, we're delegating decisions, we're using the scientific method, and we're eliminating all the noise in the system that the monetary system and this fashion vanity culture has created, but they still believe that if you give someone power where they can say, you know, have the, have the ability to affect society broadly, that they'll use it for negative purposes. And this is a general thing we run into a lot with people. Uh, that, I think uh, what would know. help that, Peter, is uh, the very fact that you were brought up on an Indian reservation. When you think in terms of an Indian group living together, you think in terms of a wigwam. You think in terms of dancing around a fire. Is that natural for Indians? No, it's what they learn living in that environment. If you took the son of a physicist, a uh, material scientist, and brought him up by the headhunters of the Amazon, he'd be a headhunter. No, there is no freedom right. of choice since your environment affects your behavior, your values, your concepts of right and wrong, good and bad. If you're brought up in a Catholic environment, you think like a Catholic. If you're brought up by parents that are agnostic, you may be inclined toward agnosticism. So I would see, I, I uh, would say that it should be obvious if you're brought up by a batch of gypsies, you would behave like a gypsy. Unless you read other books or met other people or had experiences different than that of the majority of people. Right. All the values that we have are given to us to perpetuate this system. And understanding that the environment shapes behavior, it would then we would have to look at the environment and begin to question and change it, and that wouldn't be acceptable. Right. I think um, most of the members listening right now, I think, have a decent sense of this, though they still have certain issues where they think about <clears throat> the, the larger problems, the, the well, excuse me, the more... Uh, extreme issues of a rapist or a murderer and things like this. And okay. Well, go ahead. 
say two guys disagree with with each other, and they get in a fight in a bar room, and one guy punches another guy, and he falls with a head against against some concrete block, and he dies. Is he a murderer? Suppose he socked him, and he fell in the area where he didn't die. When is a person a criminal? In other words, if you're brought up in an emotional environment, very emotional, say early uh, primitive society, where you say you let that guy look at your sister that way, if you're brought up in that kind of society, you say, I want to punch the hell out of that guy. And if you're punching him, if you help him to kill him, strike him a certain way, you're a murderer. Don't you see? And if another person says, well, i got to feed my family, I think I'll, I'll rob a bank. Well, when he goes in there with a gun, if a certain person threatens him, he instantaneously pulls a trigger. He's now a murderer. If he happens not to, he's not a murderer. He's just a bank robber. So I would say people poorly equipped intellectually that don't know how to solve problems. When I was a kid during the last depression, if I wanted to eat, I would knock at the door of a house and I'd say, can I mow your lawn or do something for a sandwich? Whereas other kids might sneak in the back way and try to steal food from the refrigerators. They don't have the tools to handle problems. A lot of people are poorly equipped to deal with problem solving. Some people make a fist to solve the problem. When their wife doesn't agree with them, they beat them up because they don't have enough tools to know what else can be done. There are many ways of bridging the difference. The same with a rapist. A rapist is a person that's been brought up in an environment where they think about sex in terms of rape because they are not good or they're not able to attain sex. And so when they rape, they associate rape and force with pleasure. And so they become conditioned. You have to watch children. You know, when I was a kid, this may seem strange to most of you, but the kids in my neighborhood used to tie a track, tie a cat to the railroad tracks. Why did they do that? Because they needed excitement in their life. There was no excitement. And they used to stand near subway terminals and drop bricks down on the subway trains. What they really needed was excitement in their lives. You know, again, when I was a kid, as you probably know by now, I'm 93 years old. When I was a kid, it was uh, normal to create your own excitement because there's not enough excitement, and motion pictures serve that need to a limited extent. But really, all kids need excitement in their lives. They need the, they need the experience of solving problems. They need adventure. They need all the things that make a well-rounded intellect. If they don't get that, I'm going to tell you what used to happen. I haven't seen it today. But people, when I was a kid, would sit up on a telephone pole. They'd sit on a telephone pole for eight days trying to break the world record. Why do they do that? They're trying to say something. They're trying to say, damn it, I exist. Look at me. That's why guys drive racing cars. They don't drive racing cars because they're interested in improve, improving a carburetor or getting better mileage or testing a vehicle. They do it for ego reasons. When they drive that race car, everybody respects them. Boy, you did a good job. You won that race. But let me tell you this. If that car bangs into the wall, bursts into flames, and the guy is burned alive, they say, boy, you should have been there. You don't know what you missed. The things that we call right and normal will not exist in the future. Right, right. Yeah, that's a, those are great points. I think um, that's the difficult thing. I've I've had communicating, and I've <clears throat> I've gotten feedback from others that they they can't seem to get past this with most people. How would you approach somebody who has just now learned of the Venus Project, just now learned of of the idea of the resource based economy and a monetary list system? How would you begin to communicate this? What would you give tip-wise to other members that are trying to help? uh, Peter, I wouldn't try to do that with each individual. It would take a long time. Well, you know what I mean. An initial introduction to try and pull people into this idea. You know, how would you begin breaking this to them in regards to the problems that we have today and and, and things?
I was just curious if you had a general approach you use, because I know you've been talking about this for years. Yes. Well, what we would do is make motion pictures and show people how animals behave, what makes them friendly or arrogant or uh, attack people. Sure. All animals are subject to also environmental influences. The little puppy that has difficulty getting to mother's breast for feeding is pushed back by the other puppies. And by the way, the puppy that's pushed back most usually becomes a leader in the future. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Interesting thing. Didn't. So we really don't know what to look for in terms of rearing children to become creative. When my old child, my own little boy came to me and said, Daddy, the wheel came off my car and I took it and I threw it in the wastebasket. And I watched that kid from the side, and that lower lip went out, and he said, Daddy, why did you throw it away? And I said, I'll get your baby toys where the wheels don't come off. And he said, maybe I can fix it. Then I took it back out of the garbage and gave it to him, and he really did try to get the wheel on, and after a few minutes, he got it on. Then I picked him up and said, that's wonderful. How did you do that? He says, I'm not that little. And then I said to him, how did you do it? He said, you see the hole in the wheel and the iron shaft sticking up? He didn't use shaft, piece of iron sticking up. I pushed the wheel, the hole over the iron shaft, and that's how I fixed it. And that's when you reward kids. But if you say, let Daddy do this for you, let Daddy solve that for you, always coming to Daddy for solutions, you produce a blob that doesn't think at all. Sure. Sometimes you have to put your kid in the con confrontation situation where they learn how to solve problems. But if you do everything for them, you kill incentive and creativity. Would you, would you say that the, the youngest stages of, uh, of growth are the most important of, uh, of a human being? Yes, I would. Okay. I would say that. And I would say that it takes a certain time for normal people to begin to communicate with their children. I wanted to communicate with my little boy when he was in the crawling stage, before language, about three months old. And so I put a rubber ball in one end of the crib, and I knew that sooner or later he would squeeze it, just accidentally. And when he squeezed it, lights would go on above the crib. And he was so fascinated by that, he let go of the ball, and he started to cry. He had to touch that ball five, six, or seven times before he knew that that ball made the lights go on above the crib. Once that was established, I put another ball at the other end of the crib, a rubber ball, and he crawled right over and squeezed it, because that's called associative memory. And nothing happened with the lights above the crib, but lights on the wall went up and down in zigzag fashion. He knew one ball controlled the lights above the crib and the other ball controlled the lights on the wall. That's the beginning of communication. I then set up three or four balls that he would squeeze to get different effects. I knew he understood it because he did look in the right direction. So you don't have to wait till the child can begin to speak. You can communicate with a child much earlier. And you don't have to teach your children Jack and the Beanstalk or Little Red Riding Hood. You can teach them geology, mathematics. Children can learn anything just as soon as they learn the garbage you put into their heads. Right. Like the Mickey Mouse Club. What, what good is that sort of thing? It's right. socially offensive. It holds people back. And there are millions of kids that look forward to become a member of the Mickey Mouse Club. Right. <laughs> we create the damage of our own culture. When war comes, we create killing machines, soldiers, teach them how to become killing machines. What do you think would happen if we took most soldiers and sent them to college <clears throat> to become problem solvers yeah. rather than killing machines? Right, right. So I'm trying to tell people something. I'm trying to tell you that all wars are phony. They're big business. People make millions of dollars 
selling submarines, aircraft, I mean billions of dollars. If war were real, if a man puts his life up for his country because he loves his country, you should conscript all the war industries so no one makes a profit for the duration after the war, give it back to free enterprise. Well, if you did that, I don't think there'd be wars. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. That's what I mean by environment. And if you still don't know what environment means, if you want your kid to become a ballet dancer, you put him in a ballet environment. If you want a kid to be a musician, you send him to a music school. And there, that's an environment of music. If a kid's to become an engineer, you send them to university, which is an engineering environment. That's what I mean by environment. I mean the prime effectors of that kind of behavior. And if you want to learn Spanish, you go to a Spanish class. That's what I mean by environment. And normal people are brought up in an aberrated environment where they get angry, they make a fist, they get into fights, they disagree. What they have to learn is how to relate to others and honestly disagree without getting angry. See, this kind of training is missing in school. In schools, they have debate. A debating team is out there to win, not to share ideas. So in the future, instead of debating teams, you have dialogue, sharing ideas where I learned a lot from you, and I hope you've learned something from me. But in a debate, you go there to win. When you go to a ball game, you hope that the team you favor wins. Someday we'll be able to go to a ball game and watch two teams play and say, you know, Johnson was great on this team and Harrison was great on the other. But when you go rooting for your own kind, that produces aberrant behavior. Unfortunately, there are many fights at ball games, physical disagreements where they punch one another. And then you've got boxing, where two people punch the hell out of each other. For what? For some aberrated people that go to see that thing? Look, I'm not condemning you if you go to prize fights. I know you've been brought up in an environment where that is normal. I cannot condemn you for going to an air show to watch the Blue Angels fly upside down near the ground. Why should they have to do that to amuse a lot of people that are aberrated? So I think in the future, there will be no people walking a tight wire between buildings and nobody doing anything like flying upside down to a hangar to produce sensation and aberrant, nurture aberrant behavior. Look, I'm not against people developing their skills, but beating the other fellow is not a skill. It's aberrant behavior. I don't like people boxing in a ring because it damages the brain of both of them. So I see no future in that. I don't like people wrestling with each other and throwing each other down toward the ground. That doesn't produce anything. Nothing intelligent comes out of that. There are many ways you can swim, go in for fancy diving without hurting anybody. There are many things you can do if you want to without hurting other people. That right. kind of competition in sports really just gives people a propensity to use them for war. You know, the mentality right. of us against them. Right. Things like the Boy Scouts, you know, the Boy Scouts to me seem to be like a, an initial stage to get children prepared for the military. Do you, is that, would you guys feel the same way about certain child institutions like that? You know? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't get that last thing. I, I was just commenting on uh, the Boy Scouts and these, these sort of youth institutions that basically advocate, um, you know, they're sort of preparing children for military service. Uh, you see these types of things. Maybe the Boy Scouts isn't the best example. but uh, Well, that's all marching in school, right, uh, right. the behavior that they've got regarding your school and your team, or I'm a Filipino and I'm proud of it, and I'm Mexican and I'm proud of it. Right, exactly. Women's rights, that separates people. That's right. the wrong direction. All people should have access to all of the necessities of life, medical care, education, without a price tag. Right, exactly. But thing, um, if you do that, you're going to have aberration, war, economic boom and bust. Not because people are bad or selfish, because the environment has been steadied and not altered. You know, in technology today, 
the computers are getting faster, better, lighter, smaller, and they do much more. Your cameras have no film anymore. There are also cell phones. Things are getting better technically, but our social values are hundreds of years old, and the whole idea of electing politicians to political office is really obsolete. They do not have the ability to solve problems. They don't even know what the problem is. If you ask a politician, why is the crime rate increasing during depression? What makes aberrant behavior? Ask a judge that or a lawyer. They have no idea, yet they're in charge of governments. These are the most ignorant people in the world today. Scientists are called upon to make atomic weapons. Of course they're not bright in that area, and they make atomic weapons. If they were really scientists, they would try to understand other nations and try to bridge the difference, not develop killing machines. We give scientists lots of physical equipment to make weapons of war. We've never given scientists the challenge of finding out why we have aberrant behavior. What war is? What, what are the forces that generate the attitudes in nations that make them want to kill one another? It's because few nations control much of the resources of the earth, the valuable resource, and other nations are left in deprivation. That's why they invade other countries. If you don't understand that, you can by checking the history of war. There are many, many books out called uh, the one in particular that Fortune magazine ran years ago was fight? called Arms and the Men. Gives you a real picture of the war. Why some people in World War I would not bomb German munition dumps because DuPont had holdings in that particular munitions company. You will see uh, the book Arms and the Men, which points that out, it's hardly available today. Those books were available. Another one that would help you is called A Hundred Million Guinea Pigs, How the Drug Industry Shafts People. And the public demanded a Pure Food and Drug Administration to check the claims of the drug industry. Today, those organizations are operated by former members of the drug company. In other words, it seems that corruption gets into everything involving money. So as long as you have a money system or a monetary system, you're going to have problems. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, um, let's take the other side of this regarding human behavior. I want you to, want you to talk about non, non-environmental influences on human behavior, such as neurochemicals, such as uh, physiological traits. Like you had mentioned before in regard to in- instinct that a bear doesn't a bear doesn't have the instinct to hibernate. It's actually a tropistic relationship because of the weather, correct? Yes, temperature. Right. Uh, the same with human behavior. If a child is not fed nutritious food and eats lots of junk food and lives in an environment, say, where husbands and wives do not relate well, what happens is a lot of argument. And the more argument and stress a normal human is subject to, the mile and cheek or these, the insulation around the nerve fibers become thinner and they become more edgy. So you see, even the environment may emphasize temperament and aggressive behavior. So in the future, people will be well-schooled in good nutrition, proper sleep, low noise level in the community. You know, continuous noise level in the community diminishes the jacket of fat or insulation around your nerves and produces edginess in behavior and more arrogance in behavior. We know now enough about human behavior to be able to design an environment that is much saner than the one we live in today. And I'm talking about all nations, not the United States. The United States is one of the most corrupt nations in the world, but all of the others are basically corrupt because of the value system and the use of money and the limitations that religion has, the influence that religion has on people. What they do is people that become religious judge people as good or bad. We don't. 
we say, what kind of environment have they come from that made them do that sort of horrible thing? What makes a serial killer? Why are some people very hostile? Why do people commit rape? We want to know the mechanisms in the environment that generate aberrant behavior and not eliminate them, but outgrow the need for that kind of behavior. There's nobody's going to tell you what to do in the future, but you'll be brought up in an environment where people really care about other people. Today, every person is involved in their own little selfish, surrounded life. What's in it for me? And that's the way nations are today. They don't fight to bring democracy to another country. They're really interested in oil, money, selling armaments, and how to protect our own vested interests. Yeah, precisely. I couldn't agree more. In, in a way, what you're advocating with the Venus Project isn't so much a technological society. It's really a different form of conditioning to create human beings that actually work together and respect each other. That's really the point, wouldn't you say? Exactly that. Yeah. In other words, if you bring up children in a home with warmth and love, they have warmth and love to give. If they're brought up in a home where the parents fight continuously and the child is neglected, that child has no warmth to give. You don't put him in jail. He's a victim of culture. I hope you know what that means now when I use the term of victim of culture. If you're brought up in a temperamental culture, very patriotic, or say like Poland, and Poland believed in the cavalry, and the Germans believed in war tanks, and so when the Germans met with the Polish, they wiped out the cavalry because they couldn't change. They, they were brought up with such rigid structures of the way armies ought to be. The nation that cannot make the adjustment to the future will be bypassed by other nations that can. And if you don't do your own thinking, others will do your thinking for you. It's called fascism. And we're moving in that direction. Roxanne and I cannot change in the world. Can change. We cannot change the world. Neither can anyone else. It depends on how much work you do, how much effort you put out toward changing people and making them aware of the factors that are responsible for human behavior. Right, and that's exactly what uh, this movement is attempting to do because we, uh, we recognize the difficulty and we try to, uh, well, essentially the, the numbers have to speak for themselves. And it's my hope, and I, I say this to everyone out there, that we have to spread this information and get massive, massive numbers, millions and millions of people. And I think Jacques would agree. It's really the people themselves understanding this and understanding what the goal is, understanding uh, all the attributes that Jacques has talked about. And until that understanding is there, it's very difficult for us to do anything well, else. Would you agree? If you wonder why people always seem to move in the wrong direction, the great majority of people, because it's easy to understand. When you say things like, I believe in the good old USA, simple things like that people understand. But when you get into the nature of human behavior and all that, it's too difficult for them. Right. So that's why they seem to align themselves with fascism. There's a greater tendency for our country to go to the right, severe right, because it's easy to understand. Right. When you say it's the goddamn Greeks that create the problem, it's the damn blacks that create the problem, it's the damn Jews that create the problem, that's easy to understand, and it's untrue. It's yes. the environment that generates patterns of behavior that we don't like. Right. So the reason people seem to move in the simple direction because it's easy to understand. God made the world. He made everything. So God bless America. Who the hell are you to tell God who to bless? If God made all the people to the earth, you don't say God bless America. You don't tell God what to do. It's such an aberrated society that our religion has become corrupt and money-oriented. But we think you're right. What is needed most of all is exposure to these ideas and an understanding. And having people expose these ideas as quickly as they can in any form that they can to other people. Even if we built the first city and we brought in people with the same value systems of today, we'd have the same problems. Right. We do have to have enough people that understand this and demand this as the system starts to fall apart because they don't know what direction 
to work towards, and the system is already falling apart. Absolutely. And uh, one comment I would say for the listeners that um, happen to consider this globalist New World Order, these old notions, which I'm sure, Jacques, you've been, you had heard about for years, this idea of a banking, essentially a banking corporate monopoly of the planet, which is the worst thing we could hope for, which seems to be kind of you know moving forward with these new renovations they're doing with this hideous monetary system. Many people try to blame these people for everything, just like they try to blame the blacks or the Jews, and it's the easy way out, and it's easy to understand. That isn't the root of the problem, and I hope everyone out there fully understands what Josh's talking about in that regard. Now, one thing I would like to, to bring up, though, is in the, in, at this point in time, as we begin this transition, how, what should we do as far as, what are your feelings as far as the state of affairs right now, and should our focus be on education solely, or should we begin to combat certain attributes of the system that might make our life that much more difficult as time moves forward. Do you know what I mean as far yes, as all, I, all these... Yes, I do yeah. understand. I think that you should learn all you can about the Venus Project and not project your own values into it. It is not a technical elitism. It is not a world run by scientists and technicians. They're just as limited as anyone else. It is not a dictatorship of engineering. It is not a robotically run society. It is no, it is not a takeover by robots. All that the robots do in the future is produce goods and services and transport those goods and services to access centers. The robots do not control people, just production and distribution. People are free to make the choices that they are inclined to make in a saner society. When you want to go to college, you don't owe any money. It's there for your purpose, for your growth. We encourage individuality, creativity in the arts and sciences so that all people become creative and contributors to the well-being of all the Earth's people. Instead of our loyalty to America, we all pledge allegiance to the Earth and all the people on it. We take care of the environment, restore the oceans, the damaged reefs. This is the job of the future. People keep asking me, well, if machines do a lot of the work, what will people do? We don't even know how to cure cystic fibrosis, heart disease. There are many things we don't know, and lots of things we'll be working on. So yeah, there'll be limitless options for you in the future to pick whatever direction you choose. But all of the options will be socially constructive. We have to be careful that we don't get sidetracked into patchwork in this system. Like the activists are demanding more democracy or human rights or um, women's rights or trying to get involved in black rights or Polish rights. It's human rights that we need. And this system will, not, will, will never make things fair or just. But the resource-based economy enables everybody to have rights and access to all goods and services. So if you get involved with something like the green movement or building a, a green building, that's not going to solve the problem. We need a social direction that incorporates all those things. Absolutely. And the, the question that comes up again, I, I know that you've addressed it at different points, is the, is the transition. Obviously, the failure of the monetary system due to both the shenanigans and the absurdity of their current practices coupled with technological unemployment is going to be the nail in the coffin, I think. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes, and, I do. I and, think that things have to get so bad right. that people lose confidence in the people they elected to office. Right. Only when that happens will they be looking for new things. Right. And also the transition will be painful. It's not going to be smooth. It really depends on how much work everybody else does as to how uh, damaging the transition will be. Right. Do you, I mean, obviously the establishment is going to be a big problem. Um, the establishment seems to be tightening the reins on the society right now in, in the U.K. They're going to monitor every single email that's being sent, mail that's being sent, mail. And in the U.S., they are trying to shut down the internet for states of emergency. Big brother, what's that? Big brother at work. Oh, absolutely, and that's that's a big problem that I wanted to just kind of get your opinions on. How well, do we? Go ahead. Automobile companies.
can't turn out a competitive product and the banks fail and we give all the public funds to the banks and the people that created the problems in the first place. Right, That's yeah. what they're doing. They run the country. You think you have a democratic president? There's no such thing. Right. If the president did things that, will, that would really be for the benefit of humanity, I can assure you he'll be taken out, if you know what that means. Yes, of course. So of course. the kind of system you live in is giving the public funds, the pensions, to the people that created the problems in the first place. They don't give a damn about people, obviously. If you give your money to General Motors or Ford or any corporation that can't operate, what makes you think it's going to operate? Suppose you did give your money to General Motors and they did turn out cars. We know the public doesn't have the money to buy the cars, so what good is it, even if they could turn out the cars? Your system is about to collapse, and when it does, we hope there's enough people that know about the Venus Project proposals. And if you don't know enough about it, check it out, thevenusproject.com. And the Zygeist Movement.com. Right. Well, everyone, you're, everyone listening right now is most right. likely uh, very much aware of those. <laughs> but absolutely, yeah. and that's, that's, exactly what, um, that's exactly the kind of motivation I'm trying to get people uh, to feel with this and to understand the importance of it. As far as the transition, there are two things that keep coming up, which um, if you have anything to add to it, regarding first the feature film, which details the lifestyle at a high, high quality production, and the second is the first city. And is there anything you'd like to talk about that? I know there's a lot of excitement about the first city. I'm not quite sure personally how to approach that because of funding and problems like that, but the people keep talking about it and talking about it. What is the relevance of the first city? Do you feel that the, the motion picture is more important than the first city? I would have to say so. The first city will be a planning center where we do a geological survey of the Earth's resources. Now, what you really have to study is not how many hungry people you've got or how many people of different persuasion. What you have to study is what do we have on Earth? What is the carrying capacity of the Earth? And the population has to be maintained in accordance with the carrying capacity of the Earth, not someone's opinion. Right, of course. We we do think that, and kind of an enter, I say entertaining, but it's really an informative film in a way that people will people's attention will be kept on it with love story or an adventure, whatever we need to keep keep it going on multiple levels. But a, a movie that shows life in the future in a resource based economy, and then flashbacks of how we get from here to there to help pe- to help answer the questions that people have. And it's it's better than just lecturing, and it'll reach more people in the shortest amount of time. And we hope that that will be a catalyst, along with your films, that reach a certain group. We'll hope that that will be a catalyst to get to the general public so they'll walk out and say, why don't we live like this now, and give them a direction to work towards. The reason for the planning center is that the planning center cannot just put up buildings. It has to be based on available resources, transportation, how many factories do we have, how many cases of tuberculosis, cystic fibrosis, heart disease. That determines how many hospitals we build, not the opinion of some politicians. We have to base our future on statistical mechanics rather than opinions. Right. No, the political system of today was great a hundred years ago, but it's no longer adequate and it's falling apart all over the world. And I'm not talking about any kind of elitism and I'm not talking about communism or socialism. In communism, they use money. They have armies, navies, police, prisons, government. We don't have any of those things. We have nothing in common with any established system. I would definitely agree with that. Um, Do you feel that there is any possibility of a step-by-step move into this structure? Obviously, we have to get people to – we need lots of people, and the catalyst of a breakdown of society is going to help that. But in in the event of, say, I don't know, some country that still functioned on a monetary system but wanted to incorporate your ideology, do you feel that without being patchwork, do you feel that there's a hybrid of this system that could materialize, a hybrid? Only if things get terrible, Peter. 
okay. if they don't get, which they seem to be getting worse, things yeah. are breaking down all over the world. It takes that kind of situation. I'm okay. sorry about that. Right. I wish that people were rational and can move to a sane society. But you got to remember that people are not elected to change things. They're elected to keep things as they are. And as long as you have that, you'll have a delay. And the delay will depend on how much people do to bring about a resource-based economy. And if you don't understand it, look into it. If we had the ability to do a first city anywhere in the world, we would do it to demonstrate a sustainable city system that could be duplicated anywhere in the world. And if, if we had the ability to do what we wanted in this first city, we would have it as a planning center for the next city to devise prints and blueprints and do it even better. We would also have an area, it would be a place where people would come and work on media to get these ideas into the general public in any way, shape, and form that we can do, from gaming to books to films to TV shows on the Internet and, and on the regular TV stations, and develop films that will reach different different parts of the population, different values in the population. So all that's very needed. We would also like to have a, a type of a theme park there that wouldn't be entertaining, just entertaining, but people would go through that theme park and come out and understand different values, understand a direction for the future. We would, want have, we would want to have people from all over the world. We would keep a sector so people could visit from all over the world and then build these cities in different parts of the world. Another thing I want to say, Peter, there's no utopia, right. no final frontiers. No one can design the best laptop. You can only design the best laptop computer with what you know up to now. Three years from now, it'll be different. And that's why there's no such thing as utopia. A lot of people think I'm a utopian. I don't believe there's any final frontiers. I believe that human values will continue to grow. And we're not even civilized yet. That's an ongoing process, not something we've arrived at. I don't even believe there's such a thing as intelligent people. An intelligent electrical engineer of 75 years ago could not get a job today. So what you call intelligent is part of an ongoing process. Right. Don't look to the future and say, what if we arrive there? You never arrive at an ideal society. Things keep changing and improving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to ask you guys if you had any particular announcements or anything you'd like to address to the audience, the members, um, before we end. Is there anything that you guys want to, want to mention in the final minutes that we have? Well, I just want to mention that we are being written up all over the world in very established magazines. Um, and, and they are touching a resource-based economy, more so than they're doing it in the United States. And we are getting a core group of people together to help bring this to the next stage. So uh, we, we really appreciate everybody's letters and, and everybody's letters that want to get involved, uh, for pe from people who want to get involved. We're keeping all those letters, and if we don't have the time to answer them, Please be assured that we read them and we keep them, and hopefully we'll be able to get in contact with you soon. Absolutely. As I announced earlier in the show, we have this new section that we're denoting, uh, excuse me, promoting for uh, projects in the initial stages of teams working in specific directions. And Jacques, I might have you, uh, for example, address the technology team in the future, the people that are interested in science and that, that want to move forward. So we have a lot of work to do, and I, I think it's really fantastic. I appreciate you guys talking to all of us, and, uh, and absolutely, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch very soon. Thanks a lot, Jacques and Roxanne. Thanks, Peter, for thank everything you. you're doing, too. Oh, we thank deeply you. I appreciate what you're doing. Oh, I, I'm, I'm just here because I appreciate what you guys are doing. So. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. 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 bye.